All right, we're going to start off. Uh, uh, unfortunately, the subject of my uh, book, it's a biography. I'll get into it a little bit. Abed is no longer with us. He passed away in 2019, but we are luck lucky to have captured in this the, captured his voice in this short video, which I'm going to play right now. Hopefully the sound. He's been called one of the unsung heroes of modern times. Fazle Hassan Abed was more than just a mild-mannered accountant. As a young man in the early 1970s, he had a corporate multinational job in finance. He could have stayed on that career path and led a very comfortable life. Instead, in 1972, confronted with war and natural disaster in his homeland, he quit his job and founded BRAC, originally, the Bangladesh Rehabilitation Assistance Committee. People died because they were poor. And I thought that the kind of life I was leading at the time working for Shell Oil, I thought that this life is not uh, really something that I'd like to pursue. I'd like to pursue something else. In the decades to come, BRAC would become massive, reaching 100 million people in Asia and Africa. It is known as one of the world's most effective anti-poverty efforts. Abed avoided the limelight. He preferred to let his work speak for itself. Microfinance, community healthcare, education, humanitarian aid, and more. What links these diverse programs together is Abed's lifelong conviction that hope itself can help people overcome poverty. He saw that poverty was not just a lack of money or skills. People remained trapped in poverty, in part because they thought things could never change. They thought it was their fate to be poor. So Abed started by changing this mindset. He gathered people in small groups to talk about their problems so that together they could confront the injustices that held them back. They began to understand that a better world was possible and that they themselves had the power to build it. This is the power of hope. Millions of people planning for the future, saving and investing, girls filling up classrooms, women starting their own businesses. BRAC is known for its entrepreneurial approach to tackling poverty. It is known for being efficient and effective, but it is far more than that. The legacy of Safazli Hassan Abed is the triumph of hope over fate. When life is for a short period in, in, on earth, and I would like that short period that each of us have to be as happy and as productive and as meaningful as possible. Hi. Um, in 2011, I began working for that organization uh, called BRAC, formerly Bangladesh Rural Advancement Committee, but years, years before that, it had stopped standing for anything, and it was known uh, simply as BRAC. It was also, uh, was then, uh, and is today often called the world's largest non-governmental uh, non organization. Uh, by some measures anyway, by the number of number of employees, 100,000. It had ceased being a committee in any meaningful sense years before I joined. It was also, uh, was and is uh, often known as one of the world's most effective anti-poverty organizations. I would say that because I still work there. Don't take it from me. Look it up, whatever. Um, just a little bit about myself. Um, um, I was a, a little more than a decade ago, I was a freelance journalist. I kind of caught the development bug, uh, a curiosity about successful and unsuccessful approaches to lifting people out of poverty. I was traveling in, uh, in Africa, I was traveling overland in Africa and supporting myself with 
travel writing gigs. And I learned about this organization called BRAC, based in Bangladesh, which had recently started working uh, in a few African countries, doing a combination of microfinance, women's health care, education, various other, other programs. Uh, unlike so many other failed development ventures, it seemed that BRAC uh, was known for being uh, efficient and effective, and it seemed to have a reputation for uh, development done right, if you will. And I was I was curious about it. It, it was credited with having transformed Bangladesh, uh, previously a, a known as a, a, a in the in the famous words of a State Department official under Henry Kissinger, uh, a basket case. And uh, that was at the moment of its independence in 1972. And uh, Henry Kissinger uh, replied, but not our basket case. The world had kind of washed its, hand, washed its hands of Bangladesh uh, from the moment of its inception in 1972. Um, and yet, BRAC was one of the organizations that is credited with having made it a, a, a paragon of, of development. Uh, poverty is still very much entrenched, but on most major development indicators, uh, uh, Bangladesh is actually above the world average. Its founder, Sir Fazli Hassan Abed, had recently, when I joined, he had recently been knighted by the British Crown for his services to humanity, and I applied a job, and for some reason I got it, um, despite not having any previous work in uh, nonprofit, nonprofit or development work. And over the next few years, I developed a rapport with the founder, and I ended up working as his uh, speechwriter. And I noticed something, despite his knighthood, right, despite being knighted by the queen, um, he was uh, a soft-spoken man who wasn't very good at marketing himself. Um, he was the kind of the polar opposite of a lot of uh, many self-promoters who, who tend to make a name for themselves in the nonprofit sector because I guess they feel that they have to. And yet Abed was uh, self-effacing, uh, a mild-mannered accountant, uh, and yet incredibly well-respected, uh, revered in some in some uh, among some in the international development sector. Um, he also had an amazing story. I mean, a really amazing story that hadn't been told before. Um, his his wife had died in in, in childbirth. Uh, there was uh, he went to school in London in the 1960s and swinging London and that whole thing and had a girlfriend there who I won't tell you what happened because um, it's quite dramatic. But uh, that's uh, everything that led him to uh, led him to BRAC was in itself an amazing story. And then building BRAC was an amazing story. And I thought somebody needed to capture that and share it with the world. I had no idea at the time that that person would end up being me. This was actually, this book was supposed to be a memoir and I was the ghostwriter. And I got about halfway done and Abed said, he didn't, he didn't use these words, but in so, not in so many words, he said, this sucks. I would never ever talk about myself in the way that you have me talking about myself. Um, the parts that were good didn't sound like him and the parts that were good, uh, the parts where they were good didn't sound like him and the parts that sounded like him weren't very good. Um, so uh, years went by, uh, he said, you know, I haven't talked to anybody as much as I've spoken to you about my life. So why don't you write it in your own hand? And eventually that's what I, end, what I ended up doing. Uh, the book is called Hope Over Fate. Um, it is available, uh, I believe it might be available at the campus bookstore or um, anyway, you know where to find it if you really uh, need it. There are certain large on online retailers which can get it to you uh, tomorrow. Um, support your local bookstores, please. <laughs> um, the I struggled with the title, Hope Over Fate. Uh, just like so many people struggle to capture in a few words what BRAC is really about, um, since it works in so many different areas. I mentioned microfinance. I mentioned education. BRAC runs its own schools. For a while, it ran 65,000 one-room schoolhouses, which basically had uh, over a million students enrolled, which made it the world's largest non governmental or, and non-religious education uh, provider. Um, if you want to ask me softball questions later on, ask me about the girls empowerment program. I can go on and on and on and on and on. Um, 
But uh, after spending many, many hours uh, talking to Bra talking to Abed and piecing together his story, I realized there was actually, it wasn't this hodgepodge of different initiatives. There was actually a theme that united his, his life's work, even going back to the 1970s. And this video tries to, tries to capture it. It's this idea that people often remain poor in part because they believe that it is their fate to be poor. And if you give them a reason, a good reason, to believe that the future can be better, that is, if you gave them, give them hope, um, that itself has the power to help them overcome poverty. Now, this theory is potentially misleading and perhaps even dangerous because it risks creating the impression that poverty is somehow self-inflicted and that if you're poor, all you really need is a good pep talk. Hey, you know, change your mindset. Everything will be fine. Uh, this is plainly not the case. Uh, and we can get into that, the various uh, uh, forms of oppression that keep people back, uh, especially women. Hope itself does not buy you a loaf of bread. Uh, but the experience of Brack is that it has to be part of the solution. And it does that, that in itself does seem to explain why so many poverty programs uh, fail. Um, many poverty programs, uh, for those caught, especially in the trap of extreme poverty, skills training, health care, goats and chickens, cash transfers, microloans, they're likely to fail if they don't address at least some of the underlying uh, psychological aspects of poverty, including a deep-seated uh, sense of despair or hopelessness. And Abed saw that things start to change when people believe in themselves and their ability to create change around them. Uh, you could call it agency, I suppose. Not It's not just being hopeful that the future will be better. It's that you have the power to help bring it about. But agency over over fate did not have a very good ring to it. So here we are. Um, the, when they believe, when, the things change when people have a good reason to believe that their hard work can finally make a difference in their lives. Um, so this may sound soft and airy fairy, but there is hard economic research uh, now that that supports this idea. I would, you know, I cite the work of um, Esther Duflo and OBG Banerjee, who won the Nobel Prize in 2019, um, who kind of posit that hope itself is almost like uh, has an almost like a nutritional aspect. Uh, it has a, a, there it has a, almost a physiological factor that you know it it raises your productivity in ways that can't really be accounted for by by anything else. Abed called this uh, the science of hope. So uh, I would say that um, just a little bit about the man getting Abed to tell stories about himself was trying to. I don't know if you've ever had a stone and you try to squeeze it really, really, really hard and blood comes out. Uh, that was like getting stories from Abed. He was an accountant. And in his, I, I said, you don't really love stories. You like numbers. And he corrected me and he said, the numbers tell the stories, Scott. It's like, okay, sorry, sir. Um, he loved poetry. He could rec recite Shakespeare's soliloquies and long passages of T.S. Eliot, Prufrock. Uh, he was an accountant at heart and he did believe that uh, numbers uh, told stories. So I'm going to um, read a few passages. I'm going to dip in and out of uh, the book, uh, and hopefully this will give you a little bit of a sense of uh, the driving conviction, I think, be be behind Abed's life. It's a biography of a man. Um, it is also, I think, the biography of an idea, and it is this idea that that hope itself uh, has a it has a has a force unto itself that can help people uh, overcome poverty. You know, notice I always sort of hedge it a little bit. It can help people over hope itself will not overcome poverty. Don't go and say, oh, we found the silver bullet that's giving people hope. No, uh, it, it does have to be part of a holistic solution. Um, let me take a sip and tell you a little story about a woman that I met. In the spirit of Abed not liking to tell stories about himself, the book doesn't start with an anecdote about Abed. It starts with the story of a woman named Shohida and her goats. When the, when the fox killed Shohida Begum's goat, she was so inconsolable, it was as though her own child had been murdered. Shohida lives in the panhandle of Bangladesh's far north, where the Brahmaputra pours in from India. In some respects, this is the start of Bangladesh itself a country created by mighty rivers making their last few hundred miles to the sea, where the land, 
fertile but often flooded, and its people, constituting more than 2% of humanity, subsisting on a small patch of the Earth's surface, about the size of Iowa, by the way. Um, and that's half the population of the United States squeezed and living in the size of Iowa. Uh, they exist in a, the land and the people exist in a fragile equilibrium. Shoida owns three acres of land in a fishing village on one of the tri tributaries of the Brahmaputra. Even when the paths turn to muck, she walks a mile every afternoon, sure-footed in her flip-flops, to sell her own cow's milk. She speaks to me. Very loudly, by the way, this woman yelled. I'm not going to yell as loud, loudly as she did. Since you're from a different country, you don't know about my land, she tells me. And her face is broad and leathery with a uh, stained tooth smile. Her gray, great hair is covered by a yellow sari, a single piece of cloth draped over her head, wrapped around her body. It's 2016. We're sitting outside her home, which is a one-room one mud hut with a thatched overhang to give some cover during the rain. When I first came to this village, its conditions weren't as good as what you see here. She speaks loudly with the confidence of someone who has overcome great odds. It was in shambles. People had barely had roofs over their heads or walls to keep them safe. And if it rained, you couldn't keep anything dry. So people didn't even have clothes to cover themselves decently. They just wore scraps. Our houses would often get flooded. We couldn't afford to repair it. Shoida was one of the first participants in a quote unquote graduation program, a term that is now common in development jargon for a program that aims to boost people out of the poverty trap uh, with a sequence of interventions that usually include training, livestock, cash, and this is crucial, in-person coaching. Long after Shohita went through uh, this pilot, and it was a pilot at the time in 2002, uh, the graduation approach gained recognition worldwide as one of the most effective ways to fight the most extreme forms of destitution. So I'm talking to her years later, and she's telling uh, her story. She married at 11, which was not uncommon. Even today, child marriage remains endemic in Bangladesh. Uh, she was luckier than many in one respect, that her husband was decent and hardworking. He bought bamboo and dry reeds from other villagers and used them to weed co weave conical hats called japis, which farmers use to protect themselves from the sun's heat. My husband was very poor, but he was a good man, and our days were hard, our days were hard but filled with love. The sale of the Japis uh, provided their only income. They remained childless. And that was Shohida's life well into her 30s. One extremely hot day in 2000, her husband came back from the market where he'd been selling Japis all morning and collapsed, gasping on the ground in front of their, of their hut. He said he felt suffocated and was having trouble breathing. My neighbors and I rushed him to the hospital around 1.30 p.m., I think they were lucky that they had access to a hospital, but even so, by 3 p.m., uh, my husband was dead. It may have been a heat stroke. This is me talking. It might have been a heat stroke, a heart attack, or any number of underlying conditions that proper medical, medical care uh, likely would have treated if it were available. Shoida had, had always managed the household, gathering fuel, gathering water, etc. Uh, she didn't know what to do. I'd wake up and worry about how I would survive. I had no husband, no food, not even a handful of rice. I went hungry for days. Now, at the time, urbanization, uh, this is the beginning of the millennium, urbanization was giving rise to brick factories around the Bangladeshi countryside where giant kilns just, they're still there today. They fill the air with soot. The neighbor suggested that she join other women digging and hauling clay at a brickyard several miles away. I remember not having had anything to eat for three days when I decided to go. I walked an hour to the brickyard south of here on an empty stomach. The workday started at 10 p.m., ended at 6 p.m. Um, the most she ever earned in a day was uh, 25 taka, which is about 48 cents. Most days it was about half that. In 2002, a group of strangers came to the village. They said they were from BRAC, a Bangladeshi organization known mainly for making microloans to poor women at the time, but they provided other services as well. The BRAC people conducted a long and tedious survey, said uh, Shohida. I didn't know who they were. I didn't want to take their money. How would I return a loan? I didn't believe a word they said. I was scared of them. We don't want your money said one of the BRAC officers. You don't have to pay us anything. We'll give you cows, goats, chickens, whatever you choose. It wasn't microfinance, they explained. It was a new program designed for people too poor for microfinance. 
And if she chose to join, Shohita would stay with the program and receive training and support for two years, after which she would be on her own. The program was in its pilot stage and had a very cumbersome name, which you don't have to remember because we've changed it, don't worry. But it was Challenging the Frontiers of Poverty Reduction, Targeting the Ultra-Poor CFPRTUP. <laughs> So uh, they decided to join. Okay, long story short, they convinced them to join. About a month uh, after about a month of back and forth, Shoida and seven other women made a group decision to join. Um, she chose to receive a native breed of goats uh, because it sells for a good price. It's easy to manage and take care of, and its meat is tastier than other breeds. Put a pin in that. Remember that. Um, the uh, someone from BRAC would visit at least once a month to check on check on her progress. The combination of a gift of goats, the stipend, and an in, and the in person coaching had a remarkable effect on Shohida. She could now imagine a better future and began working towards it. In December two thousand two, four months after she received the five goats, she gave they gave birth to thirteen kids. They added up. Uh, this was the first time she had ever felt anything akin to motherhood. She named each of the goats. They came when called. By now it was winter, she says. I couldn't leave the baby goats outside. They would die if they got cold. I kept them inside in the hut with me. The baby slept in my bed. I covered them with a blanket and kept them warm. When they got when they got up to use the wash when I got up to use the washroom, the goats would get up too. They would run outside and do their business and drink milk from their mother. When I got back to the bed, they would jump inside and take their spots again. They never urinated or defecated in my bed. They were so well mannered. She could not keep tragedy at bay for long. However, one afternoon, Shohida was visiting a neighbor when she heard the goats screaming in her courtyard. Do you hear the goats still screaming, Clarice? I added that right now. Uh, they ran out to see a fox dragging one of the baby goats away. She and the neighbor gave chase. We beat the fox. How dare he? But I couldn't save her. My baby goat died. I buried her. My heart was broken. I didn't know where all the tears came from. The next day at a group training at the BRAC office, Shoida broke down again. The staff tried to tell her it was only a goat. One of the senior BRAC officers pulled, it, officers pulled her aside and admonished her, stop crying now. You'll have more goats. It will be okay. It wasn't just a goat, she sobbed. It was my baby goat. It occurs to me after all this, and by the way, um, problems like this, I'll get into it later in the book, problems like this emerged in the pilot project areas all across uh, the, the intervention sites. Um, and it was usually problems with livestock, often sparked by people uh, people who got very jealous of the people that have been given goats and chickens. So somebody's chickens were stolen. I heard about the story who a story about a woman whose uh, cow was poisoned. And remarkably, I actually managed to track down that woman. And she told me like the entire situation in, in, in minute by minute detail. And there's a chapter actually called The Case of the Poison Cow. Um, it, uh, it occurs to me, but that created its own operational problems, which I don't have time to get into right now. But it occurs to me anyway that Shohida's sure-footedness is actually quite deceptive because rising from poverty must be like walking on a knife's edge. The threat of an illness or a bad harvest or a dead goat always looming. For those, those accustomed to living in constant stress and hunger, even a single dead goat can, can be devastating. Surely Shohida's confidence today is partly a result of the vast material improvements in her life. Yet a growing body of evidence today should suggest the causality might also run in the opposite direction. That rising from poverty may have been a result of her newfound confidence, not just its cause. Research from Obijit Banerjee and Esther Duflo, MIT economists who won the 2019 Nobel Prize, suggests that activating people's confidence and giving them hope can lead to material and material improvements that cannot otherwise be accounted for by goats, cows, cash, and the like. As I said, this theory is potentially misleading. Um, uh, it is plainly not the case that Shohita just needed a pep talk. In the case of her and countless others, despair is well-founded for no matter how hard they worked for years, actually going back millennia, if you wanna go back into the generations, nothing ever seemed to make a difference. Uh, poverty resulted from 
factors outside their control, including mis routine mistreatment by others, oppression and exploitation, especially for women. Uh, even so, when material conditions do change via a sudden positive shock, it is likely that psychological factors, including a sense of despair rooted in generations of lived experience, will remain an obstacle. So the road to that was a, a, a long one. Um, and I'm going to, uh, what I try to do in the book is uh, trace the, the, the genesis of that idea. And I'm going to go back several decades right now and share a, a story from uh, Brack's earliest years. And then I will open it up to questions. I understand that there's a lot that, a lot of details that haven't been covered here. But I think when Abed told me the story that I'm about to tell you right now, uh, that was the moment uh, that I realized, wow, somebody should really write this down. Um, I met Shohida, by the way, uh, a couple of times, the last time in 2019. And uh, that was this, about a few days after that, uh, Abed shared with me that he had been diagnosed with terminal brain cancer and he was going to die in four months. And that book that I've been working on, kind of dragging my feet, I'd like to read it on my deathbed. He literally said that to me. Uh, so nothing like pressure to get something done. Uh, I did get most of it done in time for him to read it. Uh, and it is actually, it, it, is, it was the greatest privilege of my life to work so closely, closely with this person. It is one of the greatest disappointments that he's not here to see this. Uh, the year is 1974. That's the year I was born, by the way. So um, the so I wasn't here for this. The location is a remote part of uh, northern Bangladesh, not far from where Shohid Shohida uh, probably would have met him at four at the time. Um, uh, not far from where she lives. Fosli Hassan Abed has already spent the last two years now working with impoverished refugees from the Bangladesh War of Liberation. Poverty is deeply entrenched and it has been a struggle to create change. Abed has begun experimenting with a new method for teaching people basic skills like reading and writing. It starts by gathering uh, people in an open space in the village. Uh, those of you who are students of development uh, should know that this uh, method that he is adapting to Bangladesh uh, was pioneered by a Brazilian educator by the name of Paulo Freire. If you were studying development in the 1970s, you would surely know who he was. He was an intellectual superstar at the time. His star has faded somewhat, perhaps, uh, and never, never in Abed's eyes. Uh, he was a Frarian to the very end, and you wouldn't really know it because, um, you know, Abed was praised by the likes of The Economist, uh, you know, a pioneer in microfinance and entrepreneur, entrepreneurial uh, approach to development. Uh, uh, Paulo Freire was very much a post-Marxist um, who believed in, um, he believed in uh, oppressed people and overcoming their, um, uh, surmounting their op obstacles uh, through taking power into their own hands. Consciousness raising was his big thing. So the people gathered in an open space in the village often outside in front of a poster, a single sheet of paper with a drawing based on the word home, Bari, B-A-R-I in, in Bengali. Why is the home important? The teacher would ask, pointing to the image. The teachers pointed out that the word signified more than just a dwelling. It included children, spouses, livestock, and the patch of land surrounding the hut. And once, the, once the discussion got underway, the classes would often get quite animated. Some people's homes are better than others, one person might say. Well, during stormy nights, it rains right through my roof. Why don't you fix it? The teacher asks. Well, because I'm poor. I can't afford to. Uh, next came uh, bog. The next day was uh, the word for tiger. Bog, B-A-G-H. Every Bengali knows what a tiger is and what it represents. I mean, it's the national animal, right? Fierceness, wildness, the untamed state of nature. The teacher, now acting more like a facilitator, would ask, can a tiger build a house? Of course not, the people in the group replied. A tiger cannot build a house. If it rains, he runs under a tree. He doesn't have the, the ability to change his environment. He can only adapt himself to whatever happens. Can you build a house, the facilitator asks. Of course, the villagers replied. They discuss it among themselves. If we have access to the tools and the materials, we could all build homes for ourselves. 
should also be added that even 100 tigers cooperating with one another could not build a single house. Humans be, human beings are therefore different from the tiger because we can adapt ourselves to suit our own, uh, we can adapt nature rather to suit our own needs, whereas the tiger can only adapt himself to nature, the teacher would say. We do not go from place to place in search of food, but choose to plant seeds and till the soil so that we can stay put. That is our choice. This process of changing nature to suit the needs of human beings through their own creative activities is called the process of civilization. And it is human beings alone who engage in it. The tiger cannot plan ahead. He cannot build a boat to go from one village to the next when the floods come. In the words of Paulo Freire, the tiger exists in an overwhelming present with no history, no development, and little concept of today or tomorrow. Nor can a tiger do much to help another tiger. 100 tigers cooperating could still not build a house, but men and women acting together can do many things. So the facilitator asks, can each of you discuss what creative activities you have done today? Somebody might volunteer. They, they planted seeds or harvested rice. Another might say they repaired the thatch on the roof. Somebody might have worked in a flood wall to direct the flow of water so that it would irrigate the floods properly. And the point starts to become clear. They had already contributed to the building of civilized life. So society was theirs to own and to shape, not something given to them, not something ordained by God. Acting collectively, they could do many more things. Poverty had been made by humans. It could be unmade by them too. This was the most basic lesson for human consciousness. And according to Abed, I believe him, the effect on the villagers was quite remarkable. They began to question their situation. They began to imagine a better future themselves and think constructively about how they could work together to bring it about. It would not be enough to simply encourage critical thinking, access to essential services like credit, livelihood training, health care would still be needed. But none of these things would mean a thing if the people did not first believe in the possibility of change. The first sparks of self-worth had begun to flicker, and once lit, those flames would be hard to distinguish. So it, I said I would close at one, and it's uh, I would, and it's one oh one. So I'm uh, available for any questions if you might have them. Okay, we'll we'll invite uh, questions from the floor first. Uh, we have microphones in the ceiling. Just speak up. Uh, and the uh, participants online will be able to uh, uh, hear your question. So let's start with that, and then we'll open it up to the participants online. Okay. Uh, my name is Jeff Saray. I'm in the MBA program. Uh, the question I have is you emphasize hope and uh, changing people's perspective. Just curious what strategies or emphasis did uh, Abed emphasize in terms of communicating with folks in any country in terms of rap widely to ensure that they can inspire hope and change their mindset? I, it's a good question. Um, so it started and and, and the, it, it, it it has evolved over the years. Um, so the, the the genesis of the idea was, was were those early group activities that I described going back to uh, 1974, um, and it was really it wasn't just hope it was self worth solidarity it was it was getting people people together in small groups well, I guess you would call it a focus group now and talking about the challenges that they face in common um, now. The strategy at the time, because what he was doing was actually like, I don't want to say, well, it was revolutionary in the, in the sense that he was encouraging people. I mean, you know, there were there were situations where women would get together and they would get their shovels and they would go to the um, the uh, the home of the imam who had offered, who had uh, 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 issued a decree. Uh, that women were not allowed to join the food for work program. Um, and there would be a hundred women, you know, brandishing these spades saying, let us work, let us work. Uh, so there were people in the early days of BRAC who actually thought they were going to be arrested for uh, fomenting, fomenting trouble. At the same time, 
Abed came from a, a pretty well-to-do background in, uh, you know, he was from the upper classes of the country. The president of the country was, uh, at the, I think a president and a future president were actually like at his wedding. They, he belonged to that upper crust of society. He was also doing essential healthcare work at the time. And he said to me, a lot of people th thought that we were gonna be arrested, but I knew as long as we were doing healthcare which was something the government needed us to provide that kind of uh, 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 provided an, an umbrella for our more revolutionary work. Now, as time got, went on, uh, the strategies changed and they, are, uh, they, they differ according to the context, but I would say that there's one person, uh, sorry, there's one uh, common element, whether it's, whether you're offering, offering services like microloans, or you're doing a girls empowerment program, or early childhood education, uh, offering, you know, parenting support uh, for, for people with, uh, you know, eight children ages three to five, there's one thing that is um, common across all BRAC programs and all countries, and it's, it's people talking to people. There's a really good quote. There's a, the, there's a writer named Atul Gawande that uh, wrote an article in the New Yorker called Slow Ideas. Um, it's, it's a really good read. Um, and he uses BRAC as one of his case studies for uh, his, his thesis. How do good, non-sticky ideas spread? You know, there are sticky ideas that everybody can, that catch, catch on very quickly. There are not so sticky good ideas that are difficult to spread. The answer is people talking to people. And he uses BRAC as, as, as a case study. So I would say the answer to your question is that, you know, the, over, the thread that, that goes throughout uh, is people talking to people, usually in small groups. Oh, there's there's a question online, uh, and it has to do with uh, that initial community organizing. How did uh, how did Brock bring people together? Uh, was it uh, uh, food? Uh, uh, you know how how did they get the word out that uh, uh, a group was forming? So what what was that early? community organizing look like? Yeah, it's. It, I mean, that, that, the question is still relevant today, by the way, because we're still going into, uh, uh, you know, new parts of, you know, some of the African countries that we're, that we're working in where, you know, we haven't worked previously. Um, so I'm going to answer the question by talking about how, uh, how we do it now. Uh, in most countries in which we operate, the kind of sharp point of the spear, if you will, in terms of going into new communities. That's a very, that's a bad metaphor, but I said it anyway, um, is microfinances, microloans, right? A lot of communities are unserved by, uh, by rural credit, uh, by, they're unserved by banks, and they are largely dependent on uh, local money lenders. Once you provide an essential service like that, it's easy to get people to come and you can sort of form little, what we call village organizations based on that. In the early days, uh, it would take various forms, but in the in the 1970s, for instance, there was a there were food for work programs. I mentioned this earlier of the story about the women with the shovels, right? They wanted to work. They wanted to work because they wanted to eat, and it was a food for work program sponsored by the government uh, and sponsored by other uh, uh, charities. And uh, what Abed found, especially in the wake of the 1975 famine, there were a lot of Western organizations, including American ones, that uh, had food that they wanted to give away. And that by itself became sort of the, the convening point. In some cases, they, uh, you know, they would, they, would, they, would be, they would launch it as a feeding program, and they would say, but we'd also like to sit down and, and, and talk to you and hear from you about the challenges that you face in common and, and, and figure out ways that we can that we can help you empower yourselves. And that by itself was sort of the feedback mechanism that led to the development of some of the most innovative programs like community health care, like girls empowerment, et cetera. Thank you. Quick one. So uh, was there a point whereby uh, the founder, Mr. Dan, felt overwhelmed? by the animosity of the work that is to be done and uh, how they deal back at that stage, that's one. The secondly, I dealt with who pushed back because you really say that poverty is man-made. So I dealt with who pushed back, 
there are gatekeepers working against this uh, kind of uh, initiative. Um, yeah. How do you remember this story? Would I now or previous years? Yeah, I'm going to answer the second question first. So I, I'm going to repeat what I understood the question, like what kind of pushback did he get, right? And how did he deal with that? And then, uh, sorry, what was the first question again? Remind me. Like, how do you deal with all that? Yeah, was he sometimes overwhelmed? Actually, I'm going to deal with, I'm going to answer the first question first because he was like, he he came across as a pretty unflappable guy. If he was ever overwhelmed, he didn't ever let on. And I mean, I have not, I mean, like so many of the early programs were just, they bombed. I mean, they were failures. And they really like, if you look at the history and you don't cherry pick the things that worked well, it really looks like one failure after another. In some respects, it was, uh, I don't know, it was like banging your head against a brick wall. And most other sane people would stop banging your head against the wall at a certain point. Brack somehow like just kept banging its head against the wall. And sometimes the wall actually fell down. Um, so there was some like, can't quite put my finger on it, like just brutal determination to keep going and going. I think it might have, I mean, on his part, I think it might have been the fact that he just decided at around the age of 35, this is what I am doing for the rest of my life. There is nothing else, right? I will die as the, I will, I will live and die as, as the head of BRAC. Um, opposition. He told me a story once, uh, the local imams used to say to the people, you have five fingers on your hand, right? Is this little finger the same as your thumb? Is this finger the same size as that? No, they're all different. God made people differently, right? So he made some rich, some poor. You fight against that, you're fighting against God. And he said, that was the fatalism. That's the fate part. Of, that's, that's the fatalism that I was trying to overcome. Uh, there was a period in the 1990s where, uh, uh, for some reason, there was just an uh, uptick in, um, um, in, in, in violence uh, against, I mean, it's still, it's still ongoing in Bangladesh, but there were, um, there were, they burned down the mulberry trees, mulberry trees, because the mulberry trees had been financed by microfinance and the women were using it to feed the silkworms, which they could raise in their in their in their in the in boxes in their living rooms to 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 uh, as an income generation. So there were like mobs of uh, some of the imams decided that mulberry trees were like evil and burned them all down. Uh, a delicate game that he played sometimes, just kind of knowing when to keep your head down, right? And knowing when to pop it up. So I would say that uh, Brack has remained pretty apolitical in a country that is, I mean, really violently divided against itself. So I just have a question about um, evolution. So as 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 if civilization and evolved in general goes across Africa, um, I see that uh, this approach of equality, for example, in behaviors, you know, because people have time, they don't have much to do, so they show up for meetings. But as you know, urbanization takes place, we see internal urban immigration. Yeah. And we also see that you know people want independence, right? Yeah. So I wonder whether the approach will change because people really meetings, village meetings. Yeah, not that you've meeting. really you, you've hit on something. It's, yeah. It's really not people want independence that's why we also so that's one question. Would you see the approach changing? Because my finance, everyone wants money and wants to borrow. So that may stay but everything else to do with community development. Um, then I wanted another question about legacy. So where I come from, when someone dies, that you know, the head like the visionary, then everything dies. Uh, but then I see, of course, he has built you know a legacy. Yeah. So has he put in place structures besides, of course, the approach and everything he has done? But then institutional structure. So most people have family, like you know, organizations, and you know, the legacy goes on because they believe exactly in what the father believed in, right? And they don't want to change it. But then we are looking at an institution where structures can change based on how the world is changing. And then someone else comes in and they have a different philosophy or yeah. how they want to do things based on how. So how do you I just want to know what kind of institutional structure you can put in place. Do you see that changing as well? 
uh, in terms of his previous and what he has done, and maybe 20 years from now, um, his approach and yeah, make it different. Um, well, there's a lot there. There's a lot there. Five years ago, I don't think anybody would have said that BRAC is basically a family run organization. Um, or at least in 2015, I know they're in seven years ago. There can be absolutely no doubt right now that it is basically a family run organization. Abed's daughter, his son, and his son in law all have leadership positions in the organization. So, okay, I think a lot of Americans, maybe my Westerners might look at that and see like, well, it's nepotism. Yeah, okay, from some perspective. Um, there's actually been studies on South Asian companies um, and family-run organizations, uh, all other things being equal, do tend to be more productive and more profitable uh, than, uh, than, than publicly traded organizations. So there is something like you can rely on it, right? And he said to me once, you know, I know that Asif's not going to quit, right? I hired an, exec an executive director from another organization. He was a development professional. He did great things for the organization. And he left after three years because, you know, his family needed to move to the United States. Respect that, okay? But I know I know that I can rely on, on on family members. At the same time, you do have to balance that. And I confronted him with about uh, about this. And I honestly, if I'm totally honest, I don't think his answer was all that convincing because he said, "Well, you know, we have a board. I don't think the family members would ever go against what the board wanted to do." And it's true. There are governance structures in place, um, and he worked very hard. And he worked extremely hard in the last five months of his life. The doctors gave him four. He lived for five um, to essentially replace himself. The fact that he had to work so hard in the last four months of, the, of his life uh, and the fact that he had, you know, at least some prior warning was that, that was nice. But the fact that he had to do that does speak a little bit about what has been called founder syndrome, right? Where you have a very charismatic founder who has difficulty letting go. So how will that work in 20 years? That's me in 20 years, I don't know. Um, I will say in terms of like the longevity of BRAC, one of the capstones of his life, life's work was the foundation of BRAC University. And he believed very, very firmly. And he said this once like, BRAC may or may not be here in a hundred years. Universities stay, right? Cornell will be here in a hundred years. Google may not. <laughs> And he had a whole theory lined up as to why that was the case. You had a first question, and I forgot what it was. Urbanization, um, the short answer is yes. Um, the R in BRAC originally stood for rural. One of the reasons they dropped it, because it wasn't a committee, it was no longer just Bangladeshi, and it wasn't rural because of the urbanization that was taking place in Bangladesh. And what we have found in many of the largest programs is that you have to create a separate approach, a separate modality, if you will, to deal with the urban context for exactly the reasons you said. The livelihoods are different. The relations between people are different. Um, the sense of community isn't there. That's a good thing and a bad thing, by the way. Sense of community is not always a good thing. Sense of community can be quite oppressive for some people. So I will just say the approach is different and leave it at that. Okay, thank you very much. Uh